So welcome everyone to the June webinar of the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth Global Health Research Institute, conducted in collaboration with AMICA. AMICA stands for the Africa and Middle East Congress on Addiction. Uh, we are happy to have with us today, Dr. Danielle Zolino, the head of the Division of Addiction Psychiatry and a Professor of uh, Addiction and Psychiatry at the Faculty of Medicine, the University of uh, Geneva in Switzerland. Uh, Dr. Zolino will present uh, to us another global perspective and experience in addiction medicine. Uh, he will present on the Swiss drug policies and its heroin prescription program. And he will share with us lessons on how Switzerland uh, has managed and continue to manage and navigate the challenge of harm reduction in the context of opiate addiction and possibly other substances. Uh, since the 1990s, uh, Switzerland has managed to develop a progressive drug policy that is strongly supported by the population and includes in particular protected consumption rooms and heroin prescription programs. So uh, I look forward to hearing more on this experience and other relevant uh, issues. To remind you all, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A window and uh, do feel free to share with us any comments in the comments uh, window. So for now, I give the floor to Dr. Zolino and uh, welcome him to give us uh, his uh, presentation. Dr. Zolino. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Alapsi. And it's really a pleasure to, to be with you and to, to share with you uh, a little bit of the of the Swiss history, the Swiss history of the of the last uh, thirty years. It is often a uh, little bit puzzling for for non-Swiss uh, to to observe what uh, Switzerland is capable of doing uh, with regard of uh, of drug policy. If we consider, and at the same time, the conservative uh, character of uh, of Switzerland, uh, I brought you here uh, just uh, an image of two typical Swiss uh, from one small uh, canton, the canton of Appenzell. Uh, that's uh, not pure uh, folklore. They they often are dressed like that uh, still. Uh, nowadays. It's a canton which is uh, maybe one of the most typical uh, representing what Switzerland has been and still is. Uh, here. Uh, just to illustrate it a little bit more, uh, in that canton, Popular votes are still made uh, in presence of the, of the voters by, by raising hands. So it's, uh, in, in general, Switzerland is one of the most conservative uh, countries, uh, at least in, uh, in Europe. Even if it's not part of Europe, as uh, you may, may know, it's not part of the uh, um, Europe uh, Union, which also will be one of the reasons why uh, it may have succeeded. Uh, I will talk mainly about two reasons why uh, Switzerland uh, was able to to innovate and to radically uh, innovate and still innovate, at least uh, with regard of uh, of heroin, uh, of the heroin and opiate uh, epidemic. One one reason uh, uh, is uh, is to to found in its political system. 
the Swiss political system, as I will show uh, you in, in the next slide, has been copied from the, from the US one uh, with some small uh, differences. One important difference is we don't have a presidential system. Uh, we have, if, if you want, uh, seven uh, uh, presidents at the same time, and just one of the seven is, uh, is a little bit more president uh, for one year. So one of the most important uh, characteristics of the Swiss political system is uh, what we call the concordance. So that means that uh, all uh, political parties or almost all must agree before we change a law. This renders Switzerland particularly conservative. But, the, but then there was a second factor uh, which intervened at the beginning of the, of the 90s, uh, a crisis uh, which in the same time was an opportunity as, uh, uh, as the, the word crisis uh, signifies. Uh, and this opportunity was uh, uh, was met by some uh, rather courageous politicians, among others Ruth Dreyfus, uh, the former uh, Swiss uh, president, uh, which for some years now ha had also been president of the Global Commission uh, for, for Drug Policies, and some, uh, some physicians too, like uh, Ambros Uchtenhagen. Those two factors, combined uh, made it uh, possible uh, for this important change. Let me just show you what Switzerland is. Uh, if you never have been in Switzerland, uh, you probably also will know that most part of Switzerland is, uh, is occupied by, by mountains, two mountain ranges. First, the Alps with, uh, with profound valleys uh, and the Jura, and between those mountain ranges are the main cities like Zurich, Bern, uh, and Geneva, for example. So it's largely uh, occupied by countryside, by a conservative uh, countryside, and by some for you that, uh, that would, would be small, uh, small cities, for us are uh, big cities. Geneva has just uh, 200,000 inhabitants. That's the second largest city in, uh, in Switzerland. But more importantly, it's a culturally really diverse uh, country with four languages. Here you have uh, the distribution of the languages with French, with German, with Italian, uh, the thousand part, and a fourth language, uh, which is uh, Romansh, uh, Syria, not far away from, uh, from Romanian or even uh, Italian uh, spoken by about 50,000 uh, persons. But every language has its own, uh, its own right. Uh, to complicate it more, uh, as I told you before, uh, the, the political system was uh, uh, copied uh, from the US American with uh, several states, 26 states, we, we call it Canton. And each uh, of, the, of the cantons has its own constitution. Not only has its own constitution, also its own parliament, like uh, in the US, the own government, the own juridical, juridical system, but most importantly, every canton has its own health policy and also his uh, security policy. So each canton can, uh, under a certain degree, decide for itself to, uh, to develop uh, its system. And all this together makes clearly 26 uh, different uh, characters. As each canton can, has 
some some liberties uh, to to develop his uh, his policy. Some cantons, mainly the uh, the cantons with with the larger cities like uh, Zurich, uh, Basel, Bern, or, or Geneva, are usually more progressive and uh, can be more courageous without having the agreement of the, the whole country. So uh, pilot projects are sometimes uh, possible. Pilot projects which can be locally limited, limited also uh, in time without ha having the agreement of the, the whole nation. That was also the case uh, when these new drug policies uh, were, were developed. So at first, this, there is the, uh, the political system, and second, there was the, the crisis. Uh, the, the elder, all of you uh, may remember the famous uh, needle park in Zurich. Uh, from the end of the uh, 1980s uh, to uh, around 1995, uh, there were many open scenes uh, in, in Switzerland, mainly in, in the big cities in, uh, in Zurich, Bern, Basel, Geneva, Lausanne, uh, etc., uh, which were shown uh, publicly, uh, were, were seen in, in television, uh, in, in the press, and uh, there had been a, a big resonance also internationally. That was one, uh, one of, uh, of the problems. The, the second problem were the high uh, the high incidence of uh, overdoses, of heroin overdoses, and third, the high incidence of H HIV and hepatitis uh, infection. Uh, here are some, uh, some other pictures. The, uh, at first, uh, it was tried to close this, uh, those open scenes uh, just to, uh, to notice that some days uh, uh, later, they reopened just in other neighborhoods. And that's uh, what it looked like uh, at the end uh, with, uh, with thousands of, uh, of users uh, coming from uh, everywhere of Europe and everywhere uh, from Switzerland mainly, injecting uh, openly, uh, letting uh, the uh, the rings uh, everywhere in in the streets and with an increasing cri criminality around these uh, these open scenes but you also have to know that in bern the open scene was just around the the federal palace federal palace is uh, it's our parliament uh, which has a, a a balcony where at that time the uh, the, the parliamentaries uh, usually had a smoking break just uh, 10 meters uh, uh, upside of the open, uh, open scene. So it was visible every day for, for them. They saw uh, injections and they saw overdoses every day. All that uh, made it possible to have uh, among the, the larger uh, parties, uh, a certain concerns that something had to be done. And uh, the something to be done was uh, at first, there had to be a new concept to, uh, to counter this, uh, this crisis. And second, it had not to be definitive. So uh, the idea was to launch pilot projects uh, framed by a, a new concept. Uh, what, uh, what I'm showing here is the interest of the, of the public. There were not only uh, parliamentaries who were concerned, the whole population. What you see here is the part of the population who was worried 
uh, with regard of uh, of uh, drug use, you see that that almost uh, three uh, seventy five percent of the population considered it uh, at that time the problem number one in Switzerland well, that Switzerland had to uh, to face. And what you see also from nineteen ninety five on. That, uh, that dropped to become almost uh, insignificant. Uh, here, just uh, another illustration of the of the same dat data. It's the the dark uh, dark curve you see in '95. It it dropped, and it dropped because something uh, something happened. And uh, today, drug uh, drug problems aren't anymore uh, a worry. It, uh, it dropped out of the of the top ten in uh, in ninety five and never came back as a, as a main worry of uh, Swiss citizens. In the contrary, uh, in the U.S., uh, it has become one of the the main concerns. You see, 66 percent uh, 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 consider uh, opioid abuse uh, a serial, uh, a serious problem, and 72 uh, in heroin uh, abuse. We had those uh, those data at that time. That doesn't mean that uh, the opioid use disappeared. Here you see uh, data comparing, for example. Uh, uh, opioid use in, in the US, uh, it's this dark uh, uh, line. And in Switzerland, it may not be as high as the, in the US, but there, are all, there still has been an in, uh, in increase in, in use, be it prescribed opioids or illegal uh, opioids. And if you uh, look at this, uh, uh, this graph, uh, this image, you see that most of uh, the use uh, nowadays is due to methadone. So what happened? Uh, one, one thing that happened, we lowered the, uh, the access threshold to, uh, to substitution in general, and we added two uh, to institution, I call it really, really institution now, uh, among others. The two institutions are at first heroin prescription, we call it diaphin or diacetyl, diacetyl morphine prescription to separate it from, uh, from heroin. We, we call heroin the street, uh, street heroin. That's one. Uh, one innovation. And the second one were, were the uh, controlled. Uh, or the, the protected consumption rooms. All that framed by uh, uh, a new vision. Until then, the, the Swiss uh, policy, drug policy, was based on mainly repression, some prevention, and, uh, and treatment. The idea was not, uh, no, not only to reduce consumption, so to increase uh, possibly abstinence, uh, not only to reduce negative consequence to users, but also to society uh, in, in general. And this was based uh, from, from 1995 on, on four pillars, treatment as before, prevention as before, and uh, the new pillar was harm reduction. Harm reduction meaning allowing users to use their product, even their illegal products, uh, uh, at the same time trying to reduce consequences to the user themselves and to society. And repression, we, we nowadays call it uh, regulation, uh, the, <coughs> remains at the fourth, uh, uh, the fourth pillar. So uh, the the two innovation uh, at first uh, maybe more more easily to describe the the consumption rooms. Here you have uh, the Geneva con consumption room. Uh, it's called KNF Platform Nine because it's near of the of the railway station, uh, just uh, just behind. 
Let me show you just uh, how it looks uh, inside. There you have several places uh, where users are allowed to inject illegal drugs, uh, be it uh, heroin, uh, cocaine, um, new since uh, some months we have uh, amphetamines, we, we hadn't until now, they are allowed to, to inject a benzodiazepine. What they bring, they are allowed to inject being helped by, uh, by social, uh, mainly by, by social worker, not for the injection, but for, for all, all the rest. There is also uh, uh, a, a doctor at least uh, twice, uh, uh, twice a week. Uh, one of our colleagues from psychiatry is regularly there. That's the consumption room. Since some year, they also have uh, smoking uh, smoking rooms uh, with uh, with a higher uh, ventilation, so all types of consumptions uh, are possible in a secure environment, in a hygienic environment. Illegal drugs. Do not confuse those consumption rooms with, uh, with shooting galleries, as we also had before, as they have in France, as I know you have in, in Northern America, and do, don't confuse it with the diacetyl morphine prescriptions or the heroin, medical heroin prescription. In shooting galleries and consumption rooms, you have illegal products uh, which are consumed are taken. In the diacetyl morphine prescription program, you have a medical drug. We have 99.95% pure uh, product. It's a white, very white heroin. The best heroin imaginable is prescribed by our physicians also in, uh, uh, in my division. Shooting galleries for profit, consumption rooms, <coughs> legal and supervised, and medical prescription, uh, medical institution uh, with a therapeutic vision, not all with a harm reduction vision. I, I add my presentation with, uh, with that uh, distinction. That's uh, how it looks in, uh, in our facility. It's almost uh, the same thing in white. Uh, so uh, you, you have a counter where, where patients will receive their dose. They will inject themselves uh, their dose. That's, uh, that's our heroin. That's how it is uh, prepared. And there you have the, the, the injection places. Patients uh, are asked to, uh, to clean the place before they install them, themselves, they will inject themselves. Our nurses, uh, the contrary to the uh, protect the consumption room, are allowed to help them to inject. And often they have to, to instruct patients uh, during the first uh, weeks because they, they usually aren't, uh, we, we always have the idea that they are professionals in injecting, uh, our patients there aren't. So uh, we, we learn them to inject uh, properly and in, uh, in hygienic uh, condition. And after the injections, they, they may remain some minutes, up to a half an hour uh, uh, in our uh, restroom, in, in our rooms, and may leave uh, afterwards. Uh, Here another, another image, and the, you see every patient has his own paraphernalia, and um, you know all, always keep uh, his own. That's uh, the, here, here's some results after the introduction in 1995, uh, just immediately after the adoption of the Four Pillars policy. The first uh, cities were uh, already allowed to open their, their programs uh, on, a, uh, on a provisory, on a, uh, on a study basis. It had to be uh, uh, framed by, uh, by scientific research. In Zurich, they opened in 95, uh, for example, in, uh, in Geneva, we opened in uh, 96. So, and you see 
almost immediately a drop of deaths due to, uh, to heroin use. Not only uh, overdoses uh, dropped, but uh, clearly also illegal heroin use among those who were, uh, uh, who were in the program. And within six months, you may, uh, you may know those, uh, th those results. For, uh, we have seen those results maybe in the, in the methadone programs. There isn't really a, a, a big difference between uh, results of uh, methadone or morphine programs and heroin programs. The, the, the difference is just that uh, heroin is, uh, is injected uh, uh, while uh, methadone is still taken for us also, also in Switzerland. So it usually takes six months uh, to, to reach the, the maximum of, uh, of the effects. But not only heroin, also cocaine drops. So it's not pure substitution. There is something like a therapeutic effects, which is larger than just uh, uh, on, on the illegal use of, uh, of heroin. And what is more importantly also for politics and for the population, where the results on uh, illegality, on um, uh, on illegal uh, income, uh, mainly also around the, um, the injection rooms, the consumption rooms, and here the, uh, the heroin prescription uh, facility. And also there you see a drop, uh, a massive drop within six months, which stabilizes uh, over the months and finally uh, over the years. So. Heroin prescription clearly uh, uh, was, uh, was seen to be uh, effective. Uh, one of the words of the initial words uh, where uh, you give them what they, they want, they will still, uh, they will continue to increase uh, the dose they will want. Uh, uh, always more. No, that's clearly not what we observe still uh, nowadays. What we observe uh, over the, the first weeks of treatment, uh, patients which are allowed to inject the dosage they want, clearly the, the dose increase is, uh, is controlled. They, uh, it, it's, it's progressive uh, if they want it. They usually they choose to reduce uh, those or mostly over a year and then it's, uh, it's stabilized. So one of, the, uh, one of the possible reasons is uh, they, they usually use, uh, when they use illegal heroin, it's, uh, it's uh, of bad quality and with, with big variations, whereas our heroin is always stable. It's the 99.9. 95% of, uh, of purity. They know what to expect uh, and they, uh, they know every day what, uh, what effect to, to, to expect. Uh, another worry uh, was that of, uh, of overdoses. Uh, and there is a clear uh, statistics international uh, that uh, uh, respiratory depression is rather, rather rare. And over those uh, no more than 25 years, there has never, never been a little overdose in the heroin uh, prescription program. We never had one. That's maybe important to note. Uh, so uh, the, the success uh, finally, uh, 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 what was followed by, uh, as is typical in Switzerland, by uh, a pop, uh, popular vote. Uh, um, so some years later, it's more no, uh, uh, already uh, 13 years ago, with 68% of the population uh, who agreed to maintain uh, the, the heroin uh, prescription program and to fix it in the federal act. Uh, on narcotics. So 
Uh, nowadays, even uh, if uh, a politician uh, would want to, to prohibit it, it wasn't anymore possible. Heroin prescription is part of the Swiss medical system. And not only of the Swiss medical uh, system, uh, just to, to show you that uh, Switzerland wasn't the only country, isn't the only country to introduce uh, such a program. There have been other countries, not at the same extent uh, as Switzerland, but uh, several countries have uh, also realized uh, controlled studies uh, like uh, the Netherlands, uh, Spain, uh, Germany, uh, Canada, and uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, no, that's that's a success story, but uh, the success story is uh, is twenty five years old, and uh, now we are we, we face another problem with just the, uh, this uh, this population. We we succeeded to to let most of them survive their uh, their addiction. Here you have uh, the new admission uh, to our um, program, the, the Swiss wide program, and you see at the beginning uh, many, many entries and then it leveled out uh, and the, the data are, are still more or less uh, the same. It's, it's around 100 new entries, uh, 100 uh, uh, more or less uh, patients who, who drop out of the, who drop out, who go, who leave, uh, Leave the project. Most of uh, of the patient uh, remain in in the heroin treatment for years, rather years than months, and rather uh, more than ten years than less than, than ten years. And there, we have once again our success story. They are still there. They are aren't dead. Uh, only a few of them have been uh, infected by HIV. HIV isn't anymore a problem uh, is it, uh, among uh, intravenous uh, drug users. We have uh, some, uh, some infections uh, every year in, in Switzerland, but uh, that's really, that's, uh, uh, really an, uh, an exception. The problem is uh, the age distribution, distribution because uh, they are advancing in age uh, as we do. Uh, if you've seen the, the images uh, at the beginning, I was, uh, I was in my 20s and 30s when, uh, when we had the open, uh, the open scene and uh, I'm beginning to age together with, uh, with our patients. Uh, most uh, now are between 45 and uh, 54, and the the mean age now, uh, in the meantime, uh, is over 40, uh, 40 years. And we have in our program in Geneva several patients uh, who are at the age of uh, of retreat. Uh, so uh, one patient over over 70. And in Switzerland, there has uh, some years ago been opened even or allowed also in a retreat home, the prescription of heroin. So some, uh, some uh, patients which are in a retreat home, uh, in a senior home, receive every day also the heroin in, in that home. So, uh, in the 80s and 90s, we had the context of high mortality uh, during the HIV and also hepatitis epi epidemi epidemic with uh, overdoses, overdose, visible overdoses with, uh, with death uh, even in the streets of the, of the big cities. Uh, and the clear uh, objective uh, of the policy was survival of, uh, of those users. And that clearly we succeeded. The logic was stabilization of, uh, of the patient. Uh, the idea was maintain its maintenance in, in treatment, uh, maintenance, uh, uh, maintenance in, in, in contact. Today, the, the situation has, uh, has changed. Uh, overdoses aren't anymore uh, a problem. Open scenes aren't anymore uh, 
a problem. Uh, how, uh, the, most of the users are in a prescription program, be it methadone or, or heroin, so the context has uh, clearly changed. So viable is granted. Life expectancy uh, increased. Uh, it's not still uh, at, the, uh, at the national average, but uh, it clearly increased. Uh, and the one problem remains the marginalization of many of, pay, of our patients. Only around 30% uh, of uh, our heroin treated uh, patients, uh, for example, have a professional occupation. About 30% have some. The objective, uh, the vision has clearly to change. We have, uh, we have not just for some months, but, but for us now several decades, we have patients we are in contact with. And we have to develop new life visions, new life projects. So uh, what has been uh, the, the success uh, of uh, heroin um, assisted treatment uh, nowadays has become really uh, a challenge. Our success is our problem. And there somewhat we have to, again, to change uh, our vision. We have to change our vision, uh, asking what opiate assisted treatment can be Besides harm reduction, it still is. Uh, it, should, it should be a real addiction therapy, not only abstinence oriented or uh, oriented toward uh, control consumption. It should be more. It should be something like uh, an existentialistic uh, therapy with an existentialistic uh, objective. We have to reconstruct life plans that usually our patients have lost because they begin with their uh, addictive career, uh, usually during early adulthood or even during adolescence, when their uh, original life plan uh, hasn't been realized and they seldom develop a realistic one afterwards. So uh, what can be the objectives of an addiction treatment? Uh, if we consider abstinence, it's uh, clearly to liberate the, the user from uh, his addiction, uh, to liberate him from, uh, from an obstacle, from uh, something which hinders him to, to proceed. The harm reduction would be something like that it would render progression possible without taking away the whole weight or the weight from, uh, from the problem. Uh, but one question remains in order to go well, toward what life uh, objective? So what sense to give to life? And there maybe we have to, uh, to distinguish Negative liberty, so to be to be free from something that they we physicians are usually rather good at. We know how to take away, or usually know how to take away a, a disease, a disorder, a, a medical problem. We are less well educated to think about to how to free for for positive liberty. This may be one big exception. Uh, oncologists uh, who, who are usually well trained to ask as first question, what do you want to make of the rest of your life? And uh, the, the new vision we have, for example, in our, uh, in our institution now is to begin every treatment as, as good as possible with that question. Uh, who do you want to be next year for the next 10 years for the rest of your life? And, in, uh, and how does your consumption hinder you to achieve uh, or to, to reach uh, your, your goals? And what do you need to, uh, to reduce the obstacle or to take away the obstacle to, to reach that? And a substitution treatment, and I soon will finish with, with that, can be a help to that. It's not just substitution. 
uh, consider that usually a drug user uses his drug in a certain context. We know that uh, addictive drugs uh, like heroin, but also other drugs, cocaine, alcohol, and so on, uh, have reinforcing uh, uh, properties. Uh, reinforce perceptions, certain perceptions, which are active at the moment of the consumption and behaviors which are active at that uh, moment through an activation of the reinforcement or reward system. So we reinforce the perception of certain, uh, certain contexts, certain st stimuli. I usually don't see uh, dealers in the street. Our users see them from far away, they see them, and they develop and automatize certain behavior, certain problematic uh, behavior. Now, let us transpose the effect of the same drug, the same substance, in, in that case, heroin, or the, as we call it, uh, diacetyl morphine, from, uh, uh, from the scene, from the drug scene, uh, to a therapeutic uh, environment, you still will have the effect on the reward center, which will still be uh, reinforcing and which will be reinforcing in a, uh, in a therapeutic context if you offer a therapeutic uh, context. And if you offer uh, new behavioral programs, so if you are able to offer something which the patient can uh, learn a new behavior, an alternative behavior, not to consume, surely, but also behave in, a, in other way. So to do that, to have a functioning and a really therapeutic uh, heroin assisted or in general opioid uh, assisted program, you, you need to have a therapeutic context and a therapeutic program. And in that way, it becomes not only a substitution, not only a harm reduction, but really a, a program which can help patients realize life projects in the real sense. So uh, my conclusions uh, with regard to, uh, mainly to a heroin prescription program, opiate assistant treatment are often conceptualized to be primary harm reduction for uh, substitution, uh, but the reinforcing properties of opiates uh, may make them a real therapeutic agents in the narrow, narrow sense. Uh, there are real medical drugs. And uh, the success of, uh, the, of our harm reduction uh, a vision uh, is also our current uh, challenge and uh, oblige us uh, to think life plans. That will be the future in, uh, in our domain, at least in Switzerland. And let me just uh, recall you that Switzerland was a copy, politically a copy of the US. Uh, you are allowed to copy. Switzerland on, uh, on other things. Um, thank you, and I open for almost all questions. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zellino. This is very uh, interesting uh, presentation. So Switzerland has, uh, has really taken this harm reduction approach to uh, a different level and has had decades of experience with it. Um, we can see that the outcome of this approach has been positive and that is it's great to see i'm also impressed with the with the popular support for this program so it sounds like it's not anymore an, an issue that would be debated at the population level uh, so i'd like to ask you however if you could uh, comment on on efforts to implement such programs in uh, not in the US only, but in low and, and middle income countries. Do, do you have any experience about that context and how do you expect or what have you seen in terms of outcome? Yeah, uh, 
I, I think one of the most important things is, is clearly the, the popular support and the political uh, support. Uh, I had some experiences uh, in, uh, uh, in countries like uh, 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 Mauritius. The difference you, you have to make in uh, middle and low income uh, countries, uh, you can't realize that just with the uh, inside of the, the medical system. We, we neither did it in, uh, in Switzerland. Most of the harm reduction part is, uh, is realized by, by ONGs. For example, consumption rooms, uh, uh, syringe exchange, all those things. Uh, prevention, uh, it's, that is not covered by the medical system. So uh, at first you have to have some sort of coalition uh, with, uh, uh, with courageous, uh, some courageous people. You have to have the support at least of part uh, uh, of the politics and sometimes that maybe I, di I didn't show enough. You have to, uh, at the beginning, to try illegal things. Um, just an example of the, of the consumption rooms. And uh, consumption rooms at the beginning were illegal, but tolerated. Just uh, illegal. Uh, it began in uh, what we called. Uh, autonomous uh, centers in, in, in the 80s. These this, this were uh, alternative cultural centers uh, where also drug users uh, uh, used to be. And in Bern, the first one was completely illegal, but tolerated by the, uh, by the city. Tolerated doesn't mean... Uh, and uh, once it, it worked, it became not only tolerated, but also politically and legally framed without being really illegal. Uh, so the, con the concept behind, at least in Switzerland, is the, is the, the concept of op opportunity. Uh, a law isn't applied if the objective of the law, if the talk of the law can't be reached by applying the law. So that's, uh, that's why. The most important thing to have really a coalition uh, around those projects. And if possible, bottom up, uh, not top down. That's Thank you. So Daniel, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the questions uh, in the Q&A window, but there are a couple of questions. There are several questions there, but one of the questions was about the um, medical use, the use of uh, medical heroin versus methadone maintenance, and uh, whether also the propionorphine is available as an agonist therapy in Switzerland. Yes, uh, clearly. Uh, methadone is still the, the primary uh, treatment. Uh, it's it's uh, around 90%. We now have also a retarded morphine, which is uh, taking a, a larger part. What is the, the difference isn't uh, a really big one. Um, on, on the pharmacological side, don't try to use, don't introduce uh, heroin. There is... Uh, there is no need to, to have heroin, but maybe what could be a, a real progress is to have injections, the, the possibility of, uh, of injections. Uh, not only for harm reduction, because you will teach you, your patients how to, to inject uh, properly, but also because the effect is, uh, is more important during the stay at the in the institution, so you have the reinforcing effect when you still have the, the patients uh, the patients with you. We are progressively reducing um, methadone due to the Q, to Q, QT prolongations. That's the, the main reason. Otherwise, we love uh, methadone, and uh, it, it remains our, our fa favorite. Buprenorphin hasn't really had success in Switzerland. 
And the reason is uh, that uh, all, uh, theoretically, all physicians in Switzerland are allowed to prescribe, to prescribe methadone. So it's this uh, big difference to the US and France, for example. In France, uh, in private practice, uh, physicians uh, are allowed to prescribe buprenorphine, but not uh, uh, methadone. So it's mainly buprenorphine. We don't really like buprenorphine because the transition from one to another is uh, difficult. Uh, that's, that's the only reason. Thank you. There's another question about your thoughts regarding substitution strategies for other substance use disorders, like uh, stimulant use disorders, for example. Um, yes, uh, there has been without uh, a big success, uh, honestly. Uh, mainly in Zurich, there has been a, a discussion, and the discussion is uh, is beginning to to come back to to uh, trying to substitute clearly with uh, uh, with legal stimulants uh, like uh, methylphenidate, but also it has um, several times been discussed to, to try to substitute with cocaine itself. Uh, that seems to be more difficult at first because the, the, the direct effects of cocaine can be toxic and for heroin it's clearly less the case. Uh, the main side effects uh, is uh, constipation, uh, hemorrhoids, uh, constipation, that's uh, the worst thing that happens to our patients. Cocaine, it's a little bit uh, more, more complicated and the political a backup might may be more more difficult, as I showed you at the beginning. The, the interest of politics in drugs nowadays is uh, to reduce, with the exception of uh, of cannabis. That's Thank the... you. So there's there's another question about the Switzerland uh, compliance with the UN recommendations or orders or what have you. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Yes. Uh, Two comments. First, you also do it with, with cannabis. It is possible. The conventions are, are frameworks. There are always exceptions uh, possible. Uh, the possible exceptions are, uh, have until recently be, be two. One for medical reasons, and that was one uh, line of argumentation. Harm reduction is medical reduce uh, the disease load uh, in, in the population. And second one for, uh, for science, uh, for, for research reason, it's uh, always possible. So at the beginning, the first years, the, the programs were all, always defined research programs until finally until 2008, when it was fixed in the, in the federal law. You do it with, with cannabis. There are always uh, possibili possibilities. Uh, there are other possibilities like uh, Bolivia did. You can, um, uh, you can leave the convention announcing that you will uh, re-enter the convention with, with one exception. That's what Bolivia did. So different uh, possibilities. Clearly, the Swiss government uh, at first uh, uh, had discussions with, uh, with the neighbors uh, and uh, with other countries. At that time, uh, Switzerland wasn't part of, uh, of many international organizations. The pressure was, was there nevertheless. But, uh, yeah. And you are the U.S. You are strong. What uh, what is possible in the U.S. becomes possible afterwards, also in other countries. So, uh, are the substitution heroin programs that you spoke about are they currently integrated into uh, yes. all health systems, like with other care in, in hospitals and other medical care yes. settings? Yes. 
we in Geneva are part uh, of the university hospital. That's uh, maybe one of, uh, of the responses. But more importantly, one, it's covered by the uh, obligatory health insurance. Patients do not pay for their treatment. They are covered. They are covered as if they had their diabetes or, or, or cancer or uh, another disease. It's considered, uh, heroin addiction is considered a disease as uh, all the others from the health insurance system. Yes, and that's how it should be. Thank you. So uh, please feel free to add any more questions. Some of the questions, if we don't get them or get them answered here, we will try uh, yeah. to connect with you directly. But here's another question, yeah. and that is uh, when it comes to uh, uh, methadone uh, use in the U.S., the emphasis is has been on using uh, low dose. Uh, do you have thoughts on low, moderate? high dose in terms of outcome or? In, yes, clearly know. high dose, clearly high dose. But that's a problem we also have because patients uh, are resistant to high, high dose. They don't like the idea to have uh, high doses of, uh, of a drug. But uh, the, the data are clear. Uh, not only Swiss data, international data are clear. You have to go beyond 60, for most patients beyond 60 milligrams, uh, with the exceptions of uh, really slow metabolizers. Otherwise, it's rather 80, 100 uh, milligrams. The same is true for, for heroin, uh, for example, that seems to be less uh, a problem, but uh, we have the same problem with, uh, with morphine. We have often to motivate patients to, to try at least uh, High, higher doses. We have around uh, 20 to 30 percent uh, of our patients we are, which are uh, who are still um, be below the 80, 80 milligrams. But it's clear it, there's also consensus from the Swiss Society of uh, Addiction Med Medicine at least 60 milligrams. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, we are coming to the top of the hour. So uh, right, yeah. I really appreciate you being here with us, Dr. Zolino. And uh, I thank you all for attending. And uh, please note that uh, the uh, we're going to go ahead and, and close this, but a recording of this presentation will be available on our channel, uh, the, the medical school channel. and. Um, uh, we look forward to uh, reconnecting with you all uh, next time. Thank you. Would be my pleasure. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.